Federalism Part 1. In this part of the lecture, we are going to analyze how the Constitution arranges the division of powers between the federal and the state governments, and how this applies to a couple of contemporary issues. So first of all, today we want to understand how the Constitution divides federal versus state powers. We are going to look at how the Constitution has changed over the years, interpreting what are federal versus state powers. We are going to look at the importance of the Interstate Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. These are provisions in the Constitution specifying federal powers. We are going to talk a little bit about the evolution of federalism, and then we are going to apply these lessons to contemporary applications, looking at two case studies, gun rights, and the complex politics of gay marriage. Remember from the last lecture that federalism is defined as power sharing. The national government, i.e. Congress, has some powers, and the state governments have their own independent powers. So certain powers are granted to the federal government, other powers are reserved for the states. Article 1, Section 8 in the Constitution contains a listing of specific federal powers. What you see here on the PowerPoint is not the complete list. You would find a complete wording of Article 1, Section 8, actually, in the appendix of your textbook. But here are a few of the important things included in Article 1, Section 8. So Congress specifically is given the power to lay and collect taxes. Remember, this is important because in the Articles of Confederation, Congress did not have these powers. Congress is given the power to borrow money, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states. Keep this in mind. We will talk about this later because this is the Interstate Commerce Clause. To establish a uniform rule of naturalization. That means when it comes to immigration issues, visas, green cards, how to become a citizen, Congress is passing these laws, not the states. To coin money and regulate the value of money. To declare war. To raise and support armies. To provide and maintain a navy. And here, look at the very last one. This is the last section of Article 1, Section 8. <coughs> to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Let me repeat this. This is important. Congress shall have the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. What does this mean? It means that in addition to all these powers listed in Article 1, Section 8, Congress has additional powers to make laws to implement those specified powers. The Necessary and Proper Clause was actually interpreted by the Supreme Court already in 1819 in a famous decision called McCulloch v. Maryland. Question in McCulloch, does Congress have the right to establish a bank? A power not listed in the Constitution, not listed in Article 1, Section 8. However, what is listed in Article 1, Section 8 is the congressional power to coin money and regulate the value of money. And what is necessary in order to do so? To establish a bank. Let me sum up. The two most important things in Article 1, Section 8 
of the Interstate Commerce Clause to regulate commerce among the several states, as well as the Necessary and Proper Clause, which has defined federal powers. But you might be asking yourself, what are the state's powers? For this, we are looking at Article 1, Section 10. Section 10 works a little bit differently. Section 10 does not outline specific powers given to the states, but talks about powers denied to the states. For instance, no state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation. So can Pennsylvania join into a treaty of non-aggression with Germany or France? No, only the federal government can do this. So any power not specifically granted to Congress in Article 1, Section 8, any power not given to the federal government and not denied to the states is by default a state power. Let me apply this to a little bit more of a contemporary issue. We're going back here into the 90s, and the issue is the Federal Gun Free School Zone Act. In 1990, even before the school shooting in Columbine, but after a couple of significant school shootings, Congress passed the Gun Free School Zone Act, prohibiting any individual from carrying a firearm uh, at a place the individual knows or has cause to believe is a school zone. So in other words, plain English, it creates this kind of bubble around a school in which weapons, firearms cannot be brought. And yes, there are exceptions for law enforcement, but generally speaking, it means that if you carry a weapon, into a school, you will be punished under federal law, meaning same punishment whether you do this in Arizona, Pennsylvania, or New Hampshire. But remember, Congress cannot just pass any legislation because it sounds good or because it might be called for. Congress can only pass legislation if authorized by Article 1, Section 8. And Article 1, Section 8 was written in 1787. Is there anything in this section that can be related to this piece of legislation? If you look at Article 1, Section 8, common sense might tell you to pick the general defense and welfare clause. And you might argue that banning guns in schools is a good idea and might promote the general defense and welfare. However, this part of Section 8 has been rarely used by the court. <coughs> the part of Section 8 most often used by the courts, especially the Supreme Court, to interpret the question of federal versus state powers is the Interstate Commerce Clause. In fact, most of the expansion of federal powers rests on the interpretation of the Interstate Commerce Clause. Federal powers grew significantly in the 1930s during FDR's New Deal programs that expanded the federal government, and they grew even more in the 1960s and 1970s. This growth in federal government rested on the application of the Interstate Commerce Clause. In terms of the Gun Free School Zone Act, the argument goes as following, and I'm simplifying it here a little bit. The presence of guns in schools is detrimental to education. Might make sense now. Um, if people carry guns, it's difficult to learn. 
the quality of education influences a state's economic progress. So if people, students, don't learn math, physics, biology, English, we do not have teachers, engineers, inventors who can compete with other states, who can compete with other nations. And one state's economy influences the economy of the other states, which is, now we have arrived there, a matter of interstate commerce and thus within the federal government's legislative authority. Whether or not you buy this argument depends on how broadly you want to apply the Interstate Commerce Clause. So Alfonso Lopez, a 16-year-old high school senior, was convic convicted in a federal district court for bringing a handgun and bullets to his high school in Texas. Should he be punished under federal law, which carries a relatively harsh prison sentence, or under state law? If he is punished under state law, he actually would get away with community service. But note that this decision, U.S. v. Lopez, is not so much about the fate of, fate of Alfonso Lopez. Of course it is in a way. But these decisions carry much broader implications and the broad implication here is to what extent can and should federal powers be extended under the Interstate Commerce Clause. Let's look at the court's ruling. The court ruled that the Gun Free School Zones Act was unconstitutional and the court overturned Lopez's federal conviction. The court argued that the act exceeded the limited powers of Congress, Article 1, Section 8, and argued further that anything having to do with buying, selling, carrying guns uh, does really have nothing to do with interstate Congress, which Congress may regulate. Regulating guns in local schools is not sufficiently related to Congress's Commerce Clause power to pass constitutional muster. Lopez was significant and is a really good example for our purposes here because it marked the first time in more than 50 years that the court limited Congress's ever-growing commerce powers. So we really saw an expansion of federal powers for the last 50 years prior to the 90s. In the 1990s, the court is stepping back a bit and is really reconsidering or more willing to grant more powers to the states. Whether or not this is a good thing, again, that depends on your values, your political ideology, who makes better decisions, the federal government or the states. Should everything be uniform? Should there be state-by-state -state variations? Up to you to judge.